This is Boom Bust, and these are the stories that we're tracking for you today. First up, we're talking housing on today's show. Now, rental apartment construction is at the highest levels it's been in the last four decades. We'll tell you what the numbers mean, though, for both renters and buyers, because they mean something. Plus, we have renowned economist Dennis Gartman live on today's show. He's joining me via satellite to discuss the global economy and sharing with us his thoughts on the commodities market today. You won't want to miss my interview with him. And today's big deal is going to be bananas, literally. Edward Harrison and I are discussing the fruitful combination of Jakita and Fife's. And the merger creates the largest banana company in the whole wide world. But what does that mean for consumers? We'll let you know. It's all coming up, and it all starts right now. today, housing. Now, anyone who has been looking at the housing market lately is well aware that a housing recovery is underway. However, not for everyone and not everywhere. While improving conditions in the job market has spurred younger Americans to start forming their own households, tighter lending standards have made it more difficult to buy a home. Now, for many Americans, high student debt loans combined with stagnant wage growth has forced people who would have otherwise bought homes to rent instead. And now as a result, the share of new homes being built as rental apartments are at the highest levels they've been in the last 40 years, 40 years. Now, residential construction is a strong indicator of how the economy is actually doing. And according to the Wall Street Journal, census data from last year revealed that, quote, construction started on a little less than one million new residential units, and about one in three of those was a rental in a multifamily building the highest share since data began in the mid-1970s. Now, single-family homes accounted for about two-thirds of housing starts last year, down from their peak of 87% in 1993, and about 80% in the years leading up to the recession. Now, as the job market improves, builders are betting on more millennials leaving the nest this year and then adding to the demand for rental units. Higher prices, however, is the problem that the U.S. housing market now faces as the spring 2014 season begins. Now, recent estimates show that four jobs are created for every new single-family home versus two jobs created for every multifamily unit. Now, that estimate includes many indirect jobs created by new construction, jobs such as renovations, furniture, etc. Now, multifamily units tend to be smaller, so they require fewer construction materials and labor along with smaller appliances and fewer furnishings, obviously. While rising home prices may have pulled many Americans away from the brink of foreclosure, it has also kept first-time home buyers away from entering the housing market. Basically, what the numbers are telling us is this. The housing market is one double-edged sword. <laughs> Dennis Gartman has been publishing his daily commentary, The Gartman Letter, since 1987. It's been a couple years now. And over the years, he has also weighed in on issues relating to the capital markets for banks, U.S. government entities, and the financial media. Today, Dennis is speaking with us about what he is seeing in the U.S. and global economy, as well as in the financial markets. First and foremost, welcome to the show, Dennis. It is a pleasure to have you here. Now, I want to start off by saying a lot of economic numbers in the U.S. have been coming in soft recently. Now, we have, uh, I want to throw up this graph that we have right here. Now, the U.S. Uh, GDP for the fourth quarter of 2013, it's been downgraded from an initial estimate of 3.2% to 2.4%. Then we have U.S. Q4 productivity growth in 2013. That was lowered to 1.8% from 3.2%. ISM services are down 51.6 in February 2014 from 54 percent in January and only 388,000 jobs were created in the last three months. Those are the worst figures we've seen over 19 months, the past 19 months. Now the question is, Dennis, is the U.S. economy headed down or are you bullish on the U.S. economy going forward? It's, Aaron, the, the, the U.S. economy is moving pleasantly from the lower left to the upper right. It's very quiet. It's a little boring. 
It's a little disturbing to some people, but I'm really not too concerned about the, the U.S. economy going into any sort of recession for any protracted period of time, because at least through the last 40 years, we have never seen a recession in the United States until the Federal Reserve Bank has moved the yield curve to a, an inversion. It is nowhere near doing that. The yield curve is extraordinarily positively sloped. So until we see an inversion in the curve, I think you have to bet on the past, bet that that will carry forward into the future, that a, a modest, pleasant 25 to maybe 3.5% GDP growth is, is in order for the next year or so. So I'm not nearly as concerned as other people seem to be. The same folks who have been arguing that the economy is going to go into recession, that the Fed has done the wrong things, that it's, that it's created its own upward movement that will end as soon as the Fed has accomplished its task, have been wrong for the past three years. My bet is they'll continue to be wrong. But Dennis, doesn't the reduction in U.S. deficits tell us that private surpluses are going down as well? Yes, they are. Private surplus. Well, excuse me, I, I'll back up. Uh, what, what you see is that the consumer is really becoming far more liquid. America's, uh, American consumers are far more liquid than they have been. They have reduced their amount of debt relative to, per, relative to per capita income. So, too, have America's corporations. They are more liquid than they have been in decades. I actually see, even though the, the, the government may be somewhat... Uh, uh, suspect in, it, in its accounting, uh, the, the consumer and businesses are extremely liquid and getting more so by the hour and by the day. So I'm sorry, I think that that's a beneficial circumstance. But here's the question, unless we see some sort of capital spending binge, how is that positive for U.S.-based stocks? The, the problem is you're probably, you haven't seen any binge, I like that term, hmm. any binge in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, capital spending, but you probably shall get uh, that binge. If you're a businessman in the United States, if you're a businesswoman in the United States, you've seen your business growing quietly, you see still an excess of labor, your propensity to go out and have to spend for new capital equipment has been relatively limited. Eventually you will. I, I don't think there's any question that that will happen. And when that happens, what will be interesting is it's called a capital market for a reason. When the increase in capital expenditures comes about, and it will, that will be the time that stock prices begin to tumble because capital will move out of the capital markets and move into capital expenditures. That's how things always have functioned in the past. That's what will happen again in the future. So I'm bullish on the stock market until we start to see that binge in capital expenditures. Binge, never, never considered a good thing until now, but let's move on. Now, I understand Warren Buffett likes the Association of American Railroads, the rail traffic numbers, as an indicator of economic health. Now, um, in February, the intermodal yeah. traffic, it was up 1.1% to almost 1 million containers and carloads, and now that's compared to February 2013, and that's the 51st month of increase. However, carload yeah. volume, that was down. Now, here's the question. What do you make of this in terms of economic momentum in the U.S.? Well, I think when you, when you take a look at railroads, you have to be careful about railroads right now because that increase in railroad usage is almost completely oil-related. We, we have done an amazing job with the president re refusing to, to grant uh, the creation of the uh, XL pipeline. Uh, American oil companies have learned how to use rail cars more efficiently, more aggressively, and actually to get uh, oil from one specific spot to another specific spot, which pipelines don't do very well, they've done a great job. So that increase in, in, uh, in rail car traffic has been, I think, ostensibly due to uh, uh, oil movements. What I tend to watch more than, than rail cars, I watch Baltic freight, and the Baltic freight index, both dry and, and any other of the indices incumbent in the Baltic freight indices, have all been turning from the lower left to the upper right. They've all been moving higher lately. I think that's impressive. And if you look at shipping stocks on the New York Stock Exchange or the shipping ETFs, they too have been going up. So where Mr. Buffett may watch railroads, I'm going to watch the Baltic freight, something I've watched for the last 20 years. Dennis, I love that you bring that up. It leads really well to my next question. Um, I was going to switch to the global economies. You already did it for me, so thanks. You should host the show. <laughs> now, but I want to hone in on uh, shipping as a measure of economic growth. Now, just this past yeah. Friday, we had uh, Adam Minter on the show, and he follows the price of scrap metal as a mar uh, scrap metal market, the price of the scrap metal market sure. as a proxy for global economic signals. And apparently, Alan Greenspan was keen on this statistic as well. But a lot of analysts, they focus more broadly on shipping as a whole, like you said, using the Baltic Dry Index. And that index has been choppy, but has turned up recently. So here's the question. Yes, Do you think this is a positive sign? 
Oh, yeah, I think it's a very positive sign. Certainly, it's not a negative sign. You can't construe it as being anything other than positive. You may not get joyous over it. You may not uh, 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 raise high the roof beams, carpenters, but you're yeah. certainly going to say, you know what, this looks pretty decent. Look, this is a very nice indicator. I watch cardboard, uh, corrugated cardboard box numbers to see what we're shipping. Those are up. Uh, I look at uh, container shipments here into where I live in Norfolk, Virginia. They're up. There are a lot of indicators that are doing well. My favorite, you'll love this, is cab drivers, though. I, everywhere I go, I ask cab drivers how they're doing. And whether you're in New York, Cleveland, whether you're in Kansas City, if you're in Miami, for the first time in years, the cab drivers are saying, you know what, we're far busier than we have been in the past. They are the best leading indicator I've seen. Does that economic indicator work globally as well? i got to ask you. I, I'm not sure. I, I would... Uh, I'm not sure that I would be willing to, uh, to, to make that bet, but I will say it's a great anecdotal piece of information here in the United States. I think it was Noriel Rabini who said that he used to just buy a bottle of water wherever he went, and however, that much, however much that bottle cost was his, but I like the cab driver. That seems easy. So I guess it, you're going to answer my next question saying just that, but if you could use just one, only one economic measure as a signpost for global growth, what would it be? The cab drivers? Uh, if I had to choose one, I'd probably choose the Baltic Freight Index. If I, if I could only choose one, I'd probably use that one, yeah. All righty. Well, let's look at commodities. The CRB Commodities Index is staging a return on the back of a rally of ag commodities like wheat and corn, but Dr. Yeah. Copper is telling us something different. Now, that chart looks weak. What do you make of this dichotomy? Well, first of all, let's, let's, let's take Dr. Copper and let's take his Ph.D. away from him. <laughs> but let's give, let's give Dr. Copper a, master to, a master's degree in economics. Let's give tin, zinc, aluminum, and copper in aggregate a Ph.D. in economics. And I must admit, of the things that I watch, the fact that the base metals are acting as, as poorly as they are in the course of the last three weeks does cause me some concern. I, it's clear that I think the economy is doing better. It's clear that I think not just the United States, but Europe and Asia are going to be doing better. But the one caveat is the base metals, the, the PhD in economics that, that tin, zinc, copper, and aluminum have is, uh, is causing me some concern. The fact that copper prices have fallen as sharply as they have in the past week and a half is disconcerting. I will blame a good deal of that upon the problems in the lending institutions in China who lent a lot of money on copper as a, a, as a uh, bit of collateral. And with the, um, uh, the default last week by that small Chinese company causing some concern, banks have been saying, you know what, we don't like lending money on copper as collateral, and they've been tossing that collateral overboard. Nonetheless, all four of the metals have been weak, and that is bothersome to me. Dennis, we have to head to a quick break, but stick around because we'll talk about Asia, China specifically when you return. And you out there in TV land, don't go anywhere. More with Dennis Gartman when we return. And in today's big deal, it's simply going to be bananas. Edward Harrison and I sit down to discuss a merger that that'll create one gigantic, tremendous, huge banana conglomerate. Her name's Chiquita, and she is here to stay. But as we head to break, here are a look at some of your closing numbers at the bell. Please stick around. Two of the terrific hosts on the RT network. Boom bust, it's gonna give you a different perspective. Give me one stock tip. Oh, never. I'll give you the information, you make the decision. Tell me about how breaking the set works. It's a revolution of the mind, it's a revolution of ideas and consciousness. Are you frustrated with the system? Yeah, extremely. Your politics would be described as angry. I think I'm a strong female. <laughs> Are you single? I've got a quote for you. Let's make a tea time. Stay away from that story. 
let's get this guy elected. Let's smear that guy. Instead of working for the people, politicians and the mainstream media are working for each other. Bribery, bribery stage bribery, events, bias, bribery, and propaganda. Bribery. I think I'd rather play alone. Welcome back. More now with Dennis Gartman. Now, Dennis, right before the break, we started talking about China, and I want to pick up there because China recently put in a big and unexpected trade deficit. So the question is, is the rebalancing in China towards domestic growth weakening the demand for ind industrial commodities and slowing growth both in China and globally? What do you think? Well, I think for a short term, one can make that statement. I, I, I won't argue with it, but I think over the long run, and the long run being somewhere in the next two years, China has made it abundantly clear, its leaders of the past decade have made it abundantly clear that their intention is to turn China into a consumer-driven society. I think they're on their way to doing that. Per capita incomes are rising. And they're going to be running, mark my words on this, China's going to be running enormous trade deficits in the next 20 years, hmm. simply because they will not be able to produce the goods and services that a rising country moving into modern terms, as I like to say, China has leaped from the 17th century directly into the 22nd century, and it's not going to go back. So they want, they want what anybody wants for their kids. The, the people of China want drapes and brass plumbing fixtures and, and tubs and televisions and cars, and they're going to get them. In the past several years, the past two decades, they've been running large budget or trade surpluses. They're going to start running large trade deficits, and we're going to be here in the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and probably parts of Europe are going to be the great beneficiaries because we'll be the only ones that can supply them those goods that those rising consumer demands are going to ask for. Dennis, let's turn to the Ukraine. Now, Ukraine is the second largest global producer of grains behind the U.S. Yeah. And corn and yeah. wheat prices, they are rising. So the question, right. what kind of impact is the conflict in Ukraine having on agricultural commodities? Well, last week, Aaron, it had, obviously it had a very bullish impact. I think that was illogical, to be honest. Uh, the farmers of Ukraine are going back into the fields. They're not going, what, what has happened in Ukraine is not going to stop the farmers from finishing up their winter wheat crop. It's not going to stop them from getting their corn crops into the ground. It's not going to stop them from getting other crops, the, the other spring crops into the ground. Uh, and what excess amounts of grain that, the, that, uh, that uh, Ukraine ha still has in storage probably has to be sold because Ukraine does need money. So I was amused that people were putting a bullish spin on the grain markets because of the problems in Ukraine. I think it's actually quite bearish. I think Ukraine has every intention of producing an enormous crop. And it's had fairly decent winter uh, temperatures with good snow coverage. So you're, you're going to end up seeing that their winter wheat crop is going to, I think, be quite good. I'm, I'm, I, on that, I'm bearish of the wheat market predicated upon what's going on. But I was amused that everybody got bullish on it, uh, uh, I think, illogically and improperly. They sure did. Can the Ukraine crisis end up pulling the U.S. into recession, though? Or is the U.S. growth too no. robust for that to be a real risk? What do you think? Uh, you, Ukraine is... Ukraine, is, is a psychological problem for the, for the global world. It's not a, a material economic problem. And as long as there is no shooting war that begins, and there won't be, uh, cooler minds are going to prevail, as long as there's no shooting war, the impact of, of Ukraine upon the global economy is going to be momentary and, and minute. So no, that's not going to take the United States into recession. If a recession happens in the United States, it will be predicated upon the Fed doing something. It will be predicated upon uh, inventories growing too large. It'll be predicated upon a number of other things, but it won't be Ukraine. Do you think we'll end up seeing economically punitive sanctions against Russia because of the events in Crimea? I think you're going to end up seeing sanctions against the oligarchs, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think that's very possible. I wouldn't be surprised in, uh, in the United States. We have, we have handled it very badly. Russia, I think, has handled the situation remarkably well. Uh, and I think the only weapon that we have to argue with them is, is our weapon of the, uh, the huge amount of increase in crude oil production and the amount that we have of crude oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I wouldn't be surprised if, if I were the president, I would announce, I might not act upon it, but I would announce that I'm considering moving some crude oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which would send crude oil prices down 10 or $15 per barrel very quickly. 
uh, the American public would love that, and the damage that would be done to, to the oligarchs and to Russia would be, su would be substantive, but I'm not sure that he's going to do that. If I were him, that's what I'd do. Maybe he'll take your advice. Now, Ukraine's crisis is just the latest turbulence in emerging markets. We see volatility in Turkey, Venezuela, Argentina, India, South Africa, Thailand, and that's just to name a few countries. In your opinion, where is this all going? Well, you, you, you won't like this answer. I, I'm too old to trade the emerging markets. <laughs> I, I leave that to people who are either wiser than me, younger than me, or hopefully both. Um, the, the, the friends in my cohort, we just don't understand the emerging markets. It's beyond our ken. The volatility of it is too substantive. I avoid it. But I think that the, the history of the world is that the emerging markets have their problems and eventually they, they resolve themselves. So I'm not, con I'm not as egregiously concerned about Ukraine as other people are. I'm not as egregiously concerned about Turkey as other people are. There are always problems. There are always de uh, devaluations. There are always defaults. And five years later, they're always in the past. Mm -hmm. So I take a longer term view. It's what happens when you get to be my age. Dennis, I like that optimism, but please bear in mind that age is only a state of mind. Only. You're as young as you, as you <laughs> no, say you are. No, you should, you should see me when I go to the gym each day. Bones <laughs> creak. <laughs> it happens. It Muscles happens. get sore. <laughs> now, I, I have time for one more question, so I want to ask you. Gold has been rising recently. Do you think we're seeing yes. a safe haven bid, or are there other issues behind gold's rise? I, I think gold, first of all, I'm not a gold bug. Uh, sometimes I'm very bullish of gold. Sometimes I'm very bearish of gold. Right now, for the past month and a half or two months, I've been bullish of the gold market in yen terms, in euro terms, and I'm almost sort of tangentially kind of semi-interested sort of in gold in dollar terms. Gold is nothing more than another currency. I'm a foreign exchange trader. Foreign exchange traders cross one currency against another, uh, and so I find myself long gold, short yen, long gold, short the euro, long gold, short other currencies. I'm reasonably bullish of the gold market. I think it wants to go higher primarily predicated upon the fact that the monetary authorities in the United States, in Japan, in Europe, um, in China have been expansionary. And during an expansionary circumstance, the currency, the one currency that doesn't get expanded upon is gold. I think gold is stronger. I'll be bullish of gold. You can mark this down until it stops going up. And right now it seems to want to go higher. Dennis, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but we have to get you in studio next time. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. That was economist Dennis Gartman, editor and publisher of The Gartman Letter. Time now for today's Big Deal. Again, in today's big deal, Edward Harrison and I were sitting down to discuss a deal that makes one big, gigantic banana company. Company. Uh, <laughs> Bazang, you didn't like that? <laughs> now, you've heard of big tobacco, big agriculture, big government, but what about big banana? U.S. fruit supplier, ch supplier Chiquita has bought Irish tropical fruit firm Fife, Fifes. Fifes. There we go. Fifes. That's what it's called. Fun name. <laughs> Chiquita and Fife's creating the world's largest banana company. Now, this is a $1.7 billion all stock deal and will give 50.7% of the new company named Chiquita Fife's to Chiquita shareholders and 49.3% to Fife shareholders. So, Ed, tell me about the details of this deal, the new leadership that's taking over at the company, et cetera. What's going on here? Well, actually, you know, I think that uh, it's the backstory which is uh, more interesting than uh, the leadership and what's going on because actually Chiquita and Fives were one company at one point in time. Hmm. And, in, and uh, Chiquita divested itself from Fives uh, and thought that it could go into the European market without Fives. And what happened actually is, is, is that, you know, the EU had this... Um, uh, common agricultural policy, which favored the former colonies of the UK, Spain, Portugal, and France uh, for bananas. And when uh, we had a, a EU-wide policy in 1993, suddenly all of the other countries within the EU had the same quota system that these other countries had. So all across the EU, okay. including in places like Germany that had no former colonial um, um, ties, uh, were under this policy. So Chiquita just got crushed 
and and so you know they lobbied uh, the U.S. government to go and and to have this be stopped. And there was a huge war with a tit for tat. The United States imposed sanctions and or uh, you know tariffs, et cetera, uh, and and that finally got resolved. But you know. But not before Chiquita actually went bankrupt in Chapter 11, and now they've come out of bankruptcy, and then you know they're stronger, and then they're going to go after Fife's. Who do you think is the bigger winner, Fife's or Chiquita, in this? Well, you know, I think that the big winner is actually companies, because if you think about what's really happening here, is is that you know the WTO was completely uh, unable to solve the the EU U.S. war here, mm -hmm. and so ultimately Chiquita said, "We're just going to uh, take over Fives. We're going to have you know on, we're going to be on both sides of this issue, and w eventually when we get some sort of trade deal." Uh, will be able to hopefully then you know take it to a super nat uh, a national level you know that will uh, will resolve the issue the same way that you have it in NAFTA and so forth right. so that's what they're really trying to do the U S and the E U eventually may do a trade deal and they'll be able to say oh, this will never happen again we'll be able to override that and uh, and get and get into these markets. Huh. There's a lot behind this banana stuff. Now, Chiquita Fife's, they'll edge out Dole, taking about 29% of the global market share of bananas. And the Wall Street Journal reports that exports of bananas increased by 7.3% in 2012 to an all-time high of 16.5 million tons. So Chiquita Fife's will be in a very, very good position to meet this demand, to say the least. Now, where do you see the banana market going in the future? I think that uh, where it's going to go is probably consolidation. Uh, you know, there are only three, uh, you know, three or four big guys in here. You got Dole, Chiquita, Fife's, and uh, one other. And the interesting bit is, is for instance, Dole is actually uh, in the Cayman Islands. That's where, it, uh, for tax reasons, even though it says it's a U.S. company, um, uh, you have uh, Chiquita and Fife's, which have huge presences in Latin America, uh -huh. uh, and and now they have uh, a huge presence in uh, the United States and in the EU in terms of actually being able to sell. So I think we're going to see more consolidation, and as a result of that, uh, you know, these companies will will profit. And more potassium consumption. <laughs> we'll see. That's all for now. Thank you, Ed, as always. But you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt. We also love hearing from you, so please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash boombustrt. You can also tweet at us at Aaron Aid at Edward NH. From all of us here at Boombust, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.